Next on the news, the nurses strike is over. More than 7,000 nurses across two of the city's largest hospital systems are back inside and back to better conditions. I'm Jessica Easthope with details of the agreement reached overnight. My Corvette's in a lock garage. Okay, so it's not like you're sitting out in the street. President Biden answering questions about classified documents found in his private garage. The annual March for Life in a post-Roe America is days away and some changes are in store. He told my mom everything was going to be okay. That was his last words to her. And the brother of a boy swept away in those California floods sharing his grief. I'm Christine Persichetti. Current News starts right now. Three days of picket lines, police barriers, and chanting are over. Nurses are back to work. The New York State Nurses Association Union reached a deal in the middle of the night with the Mount Sinai and Montefiore Health Systems. The nurses are happy with the agreement that will add staff and give pay raises. Current News' Jessica Easthope has more from outside of Mount Sinai Hospital's main campus in East Harlem. Not enough nurses, no breaks, no overtime pay, no more. 7,000 nurses spent this week on picket lines, but right now the scene here in front of Mount Sinai Hospital is getting back to normal. They returned to work today after getting a text at 2.30 this morning saying we won. <laughs> Jenny DeSuyo is headed into work for anything but a normal day as an ER nurse. This is what we've been fighting for, so it feels nice to know that it made a difference and that we're moving forward. Sinai, Sinai, you can hide. Nurses at Mount Sinai and Montefiore Health Systems, two of the city's largest hospitals, were on strike this week. Their biggest concern, patient to nurse ratio. The more nurses we have, safer care we can provide for our patients. Since the pandemic, more than 333,000 healthcare workers left their jobs due to burnout, long hours and heavy patient loads. Sometimes we cannot even take a break. Uh, not even time to go and use the bathroom and also there's so much documentation that nurses have to stay over time not being paid to complete the paperwork. The new tentative agreement reached by the New York State Nurses Association includes a 19.1% wage increase and the addition of registered nurses and nurse practitioners. During the strike, both hospitals were forced to transfer patients and divert ambulances to other hospitals, as well as postpone non-emergency surgeries. I feel like we accomplished so much the last three days. Now they're looking forward to a big change. I feel like we'll be able to breathe because knowing that we'll be able to do our job properly and safely and get the patients will get what they deserve and need. And thanking God, the deal was in their favor. Prayed for our voices to be heard and prayers were answered. Praying for a good outcome and for a positive outcome and it worked, God is good. The nurses union called this agreement just as much a win for patients as it is for nurses. In the wake of this negotiation, nurses at Wyckoff Heights Medical Center in Brooklyn also reached a tentative deal this morning and withdrew their 10 day strike notice. In East Harlem, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Developing news out of Washington, President Joe Biden speaking out Thursday after more classified documents were found, this time in his Delaware home, in the garage and an adjacent room. And now an investigation is underway. People know I take classified documents and classified material seriously. But when President Joe Biden was asked what he was thinking after classified documents were found next to his Corvette. My Corvette's in a locked garage. OK, so it's not like you're sitting out in the street. The president says his lawyers found a small number of documents with classified markings in storage areas and file cabinets in his home and personal library. He says they were immediately handed over to the Department of Justice. But this is the second set of classified material found by Biden's legal team after the initial discovery in November of classified information at the think tank office everything. used by then Vice every President every Biden. Time. Here's an individual that's been in office for more than 40 years. Here's an individual that sat on 60 Minutes that was so concerned about President Trump's documents locked in behind, and now we find it just as a vice president, keeping it for years out in the open in different locations. Republicans have been calling on Attorney General Merrick Garland to open an investigation into the situation, and on Thursday he announced that he has appointed a special counsel. This appointment underscores for the public the department's commitment to both independence 
and accountability in particularly sensitive matters and to making decisions indisputably guided only by the facts and the law. Classified records are supposed to be stored in secure locations, and the Presidential Records Act says all White House records are to be given to the National Archives after an administration ends. Classified documents belong in classified settings, and if we're having consistent problems across parties with exiting government officials not putting those classified documents where they belong, then I think that's something that we should take up. Robert Herr is the person appointed as a special counsel to investigate whether President Biden potentially mishandled the classified documents found. Herr served in the Trump administration as the U.S. attorney in Maryland. When asked by a reporter, the president did have some good news to share about the first lady. She was under a long time uh, for five hours because what they were doing is they take out, would do the mows, meaning remove what they thought might be cancerous, and they'd have to then go back and test it and see what it was. But she's doing really well. She's up. We had, uh, we had breakfast this morning. She's, uh, she's recovering. Jill Biden had surgery yesterday to remove two cancerous lesions near her eyes. Biden added that the chances of his wife's cancer coming back are zero to one percent. If you're heading to the airport, good news. There are no unusual delays or cancellations after a nationwide computer outage Wednesday grounded all domestic flights. According to reports, an engineer unknowingly replaced one computer file with another, causing the system that pilots use for safety updates to go down. The FAA says it was an honest mistake and is putting a new system in place to avoid it from happening again. That damaged file caused the FAA to ground over 11,000 and flights. Officials say it's still a good idea to check on your flight status before heading out to the airport. And other travel nightmares, this time on Amtrak. What was supposed to be a 17-hour ride from Virginia to Florida ended up being 37 hours. A freight derailment forced the train to take a detour with almost no information from crews, garbage piling up and a lack of food. Passengers called police. A member of the train crew told people over the PA saying, quote, we are not holding you hostage. Turning to the economy and your money may go a little further the next time you go shopping. New data shows that inflation is slowing down. Isabel Rosales has more. Today we've got some good news. President Joe Biden touting progress on the economy. Even though inflation is high and major economies around the world is coming down in America month after month. As new data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released Thursday reveals a decline in month over month consumer prices for the first time since May 2020. Over the past three months, core inflation has come down to 3% on an annualized basis. That's down from more than 6% at the beginning of 2022. The December Consumer Price Index shows overall inflation decreasing by one-tenth of a percent from November. The costs of new and used vehicles, airline fares, and personal care items down. The overall decline largely attributed to the falling price of gas, dropping by 9 percent. My administration took action to get oil onto the market and bring down prices. Now gas is down more than $1.70 from its peak. But Greg McBride of Bankrate says those improvements aren't being seen across the board. In addition to shelter costs, uh, food costs continue to rise. Electricity, uh, vehicle insurance, uh, even household supply, the type of things that you're buying on a regular basis. The data also shows the cost of food, though still rising, grew at the smallest monthly rate in nearly two years. And while there could be a light at the end of the inflation tunnel, the economy still has a long way to go. In Washington, Isabel Rosales, Currents News. Funeral arrangements for Cardinal George Pell have been made public. A requiem mass to celebrate the Australian Cardinal will be held on Saturday, January 14th at 11.30 a.m. and will take place at the altar of the chair of St. Peter in the Vatican Basilica. The Holy See Press Office announced Thursday Pope Francis will preside over the rites of final commendation and valediction during the funeral. There's a lot more news headed your way. He told my mom everything was going to be okay. That was his last words to her. A brother's heartbreak after his sibling was swept away in rushing water. We have the latest on the California floods. <laughs> the March for Life is set for its 50th annual event. What the movement hopes to accomplish this year in a post-Roe America. 
Plus, the father who's trying to help out sick kids with some help from man's best friend. We'll be right back. As the fog lifted and the world watched. The casket being brought out from the Basilica into St. Peter's Square. So they're really being very true to his request to celebrate something simple. Currents News was live in New York. I believe Cardinal Ratzica did the Mass when uh, John Paul II died. And the Vatican. He had his rosary in his hands, his crucifix. It was just a beautiful, beautiful moving moment. Bringing you closer to the final farewell of Pope Benedict XVI in St. Peter's Square. Holy Father arriving now. He's in his white cassock with a stole. Amen. Putting your faith in the news. Currents News. A win for the pro-life movement. House Republicans passed the Born Alive abortion bill Wednesday. The bill calls for health care providers to protect the life of a baby during or after a failed abortion. The bill is passed. A second resolution measure was also passed condemning violence against pro-life facilities, groups and churches. Neither measure is likely to be considered by the Senate, which remains under Democratic control. Pro-life advocates are rethinking their strategies after the FDA's decision to expand the availability of the abortion pill to retail pharmacies. With women no longer required to visit physical clinics, the life and family advocacy at the California Catholic Conference is utilizing social media and digital ads to communicate their message with women. The group says vulnerable women need to be reached on their phones first before encounters with them at clinics. And now to the March for Life. There are new details about the annual event kicking off on January 20th. This year's event is being billed as Next Steps, coming off of the landmark victory with the Dobbs decision. The focus of the demonstration will pivot from the overturning of Roe v. Wade to restoring a culture of life across America. Some other changes during this year's march in honor of the Dobbs victory, pro-lifers will walk past Congress, acknowledging that lawmakers now hold a critical role in this post-Roe America. And the march will end between the Capitol building and the Supreme Court, giving witness to the two branches, the inherent dignity of the human person in the womb. From the Diocese of Brooklyn and beyond, Catholics across New York State will head to the Capitol to rally for life. More on that in a moment. But first, the Archdiocese of New York's Sisters of Life stress why your presence at the march is needed now more than ever. Every life is sacred. Every life is good. Every life has value. We are a people of and for life, and we are pressing on. Because we know love is the only answer, and the cause of life, the heart of a nation, and the advancement of the culture of life are at stake. And the March for Life will take place on Friday, January 20th, and you can go with the Diocese of Brooklyn. Contact Christian Rada, the Director of Marriage, Family Formation, and Respect Life Education for the Diocese of Brooklyn. That number is 718-965-7300 with the extension 5541. Or you can email crada at diobrook.org. John Lavenberg, the national correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, will be covering the march starting from the night before with the National Vigil for Life at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. He'll join us Thursday to talk about that and again that Friday for the actual march itself. That's January 19th to the 20th right here on Currents News. And now more devastating sights from a massive storm. Plus, a brother's heartbreak. He told my mom everything was going to be okay. That was his last words to her. And a driver's close call. I was just shocked and grateful. Gratefulness of to have another day. The latest on the catastrophe in California. We'll begin with a search for the five-year-old boy who was washed away by the floodwaters. Kyle Doan was in a car with his mom when it happened. She was rescued, and now his brother is speaking out and is prepared for the worst. I feel like I lost like a other half of me. He made sure my mom was okay during this mess. Um, 
he, um, he told my mom everything was going to be okay. That was his last words to her. Kyle's family still remains hopeful he'll be found. The sheriff's office says the case is a high priority for them and is now getting help in the search from other law enforcement agencies, including dive team members, search and rescue team members, and canine units from other counties. This aircraft rescue rig is also being used. The large truck is typically stationed at the airport, but because of its high profile, it's now being used to rescue residents who are trapped in their homes because of the floodwaters. First responders stopping at nothing to pull people to safety. Mother Nature's onslaught in California continues with more storms in the forecast. Parts of the Golden State are struggling to handle flooded areas and it may get worse before it gets better. We're getting a bird's eye view of just how bad the floods are in one part of the state. Madison Keevy has that story. Well, basically the entire Sacramento Valley is very vulnerable to flooding. There's a flood warning in effect through Thursday morning put out by the National Weather Service for the Sacramento Valley. Drone 13 gives us a better idea of how things are holding up and where there may be a flood risk. This is the Sacramento Weir. It's not open right now. The Sacramento River at the I Street Bridge is expected to fall just short of a flood monitor stage over the weekend. Here's the confluence at Discovery Park, where the American and Sacramento Rivers meet. The park is flooded, but that's what it's meant to do. A question from viewers to us, where's the flood risk? The other places that I, I would worry about, but not just yet, are some of the small towns. Um, Wright's Landing, Clarksburg, places like that, that don't have levees that are as strong as what we have for uh, Sacramento now. We've seen that in Wilton along the Kasumnis River. Drone 13 captured levee work last Friday to keep flooding from impacting residents again. Evacuation orders in Wilton were dropped on Tuesday, but officials have warned to stay aware of localized flooding. The flood bypass systems and the levee systems and the reservoir systems have reduced that flooding risk to what it remains today. Flooding is, is something where no matter how big you build the levees, no matter how big you build the reservoirs, there's always some residual risk. That was Madison Keevy reporting. Currents News has been reaching out to all California dioceses within the flood zones to find out how they're faring. The Diocese of Monterey reporting that many of their parishes and parishioners are dealing with precautionary evacuations, power outages, and road closures. Thankfully, though, few instances of flooding have occurred and they have not encountered any significant issues. They're also paying that goodwill forward using some of their churches and schools as evacuation centers. They're asking for continued prayers. And in Malibu, a man is grateful to be alive after one close call. He says he was in his car when his girlfriend called him to check a bag she left in the house. While he was doing that, a boulder four feet in diameter crashed onto his Prius, crushing the roof on the driver's side where he was sitting just moments before. And I said, well, if I'm this lucky, I should probably play the lotto right now because that's really lucky. I felt like goosebumps because if it wasn't for that call, hey, can you check on my bag? Um, I probably wouldn't be here or somebody else could have died. Wow, so fortunate. At least one other parked car was damaged, but no one was hurt. Still to come on Currents News. We can choose our attitude and, you know, and how we respond. How one father is giving back to a local hospital one paw at a time. And two sisters using a difficult diagnosis as an opportunity to help others through wigs. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Two sisters in Massachusetts showing they're a cut above the rest. They started helping others after going through a tough time. In 2015, Diane Austin was diagnosed with breast cancer and was about to lose all of her hair. So her doctors gave her a wig prescription. The problem was Diane and her sister couldn't find a wig that resembled their natural curls anywhere. 
So I went to the hospital where I was being treated here in Boston and they didn't sell any tightly coiled sure. wigs. They only sold straight hand wigs. We started asking around, talking to these the vendors mm -hmm. and stuff at the hospitals. Um, they let us know, they confirmed that like, you know, women are asking for these wigs. So they started a business of their own, launching coils to locks. They're currently in 15 hospitals and medical salons across the country. Or you can order one online. Just go to coils to locks.com. It's no secret that dogs can warm our hearts and bring a smile to our faces. And to help pay it forward at one children's hospital, a father is bringing his four legged friend to meet some sick kids. Laura Terrell has more. Inside Blank Children's Hospital, one visitor likes to pause and you know what? And stare, but her gaze Can we say hi? Can Ruby visit? is melting hearts in each room. You like Ruby? Ruby's soft. 18 month old Kaiden Byler has been in the hospital for nine days with pneumonia. She might even give you kisses. <laughs> I like that smile. And this visit from a golden retriever therapy dog. Give me five. Oh, there's kisses. Is the first time he's giggled <laughs> in a while. She passed the therapy test on the first try, and I knew this was the place that we wanted to come. Give me a hug. Rob Ridnor is no stranger to Blank Children's Hospital. Let's go. Good girl. His daughter Jordan received chemotherapy here for years. I was diagnosed at the age of eight. I was diagnosed with T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, basically, I just kind of stopped breathing and I collapsed. Now 23 years old, Jordan is in remission, but she'll never forget the therapy dog who put her at ease during that dark time. He'd come and I'd always like be excited because it's Scout. Good heel. Just three years ago, Jordan's younger brother Jacob got his own devastating diagnosis, the same rare cancer. It was hard. It was unbelievable. It was, are you kidding me? More than a decade after his sister, Jacob too would find comfort from Blank's therapy dogs. See hi to Myra. With two children now cancer free, Rob decided it's time to pay it forward. But there you go. This is Ruby. So kids here on the third yeah. floor and their parents. Hello, sweet baby. <laughs> Hi. Oh my goodness. You're so beautiful. <laughs> Can feel this kind of joy. We have two dogs at home and it makes me feel happy and it reminds me of them. It's a level of love only an animal can bring. Wow, what a great story from Laura Terrell. And if that doesn't warm your heart, how about this? Rob's daughter, Jordan, wants to become a social worker to help people when she gets older. And finally tonight, we received dozens and dozens of entries, but the Tablets Keep Christ in Christmas art contest is now closed. Students from first grade through 12th all throughout Brooklyn and Queens sent their masterpieces. Now the dedicated crew from the Tablet will sort through your submissions like the ones you're seeing here. Winners will be notified through their principals in the coming days. So good luck to all you young Picassos out there and we'll keep you posted. And while we're at it, let's take a look at the latest numbers for the Tablet's Bright Christmas campaign. The effort helps ensure every kid around the diocese has a gift to open on Christmas. And thanks to you, so far more than $111,000 has been raised and more of your donations keep coming in. The Tablet will report on the grand total in the coming days. How about that? And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.